We want to get started right at 6. Uh, on behalf of the Omaha Press Club Education Committee, uh, who include Wendy Callahan, Hugh Cowden, Warren Frankie, Ellen Gass, Steve Murphy, Eileen Worth, and myself, Chris Olson, I'd like to welcome you to this first in a series of education seminars for the 1992-93 year. This evening's format, for the most part, will be question and answer between you and our guest panelist this evening, Mr. Warren Buffett. Our subject will be dealing with the news media. We ask that questions focus on our guest's dealings, or lack thereof perhaps, with the news media in particular situations that brought him into the news front. One journalist who has covered our guest going back now nearly three decades is Robert Doerr of the Omaha World Herald, who will introduce our speaker this evening. <clears throat> Thank you. Can you hear me? No. Um, I don't exactly know what to say. Introducing Warren Buffett before this group is like introducing Garth Brooks at a country music concert. <laughs> In addition to dealing with the news media, I think most of you know that he's an owner of news organizations and has large holdings in the Washington Post Capital Cities ABC and owns the Buffalo News. As a reporter who has dealt with Warren on, on a number of occasions, I can tell you what that's like. He is invariably accessible, courteous, and straightforward, uh, but generally non-talkative. <laughs> <laughs> you generally have to assemble your news stories by talking to other people and from the public record. It's not that that keeps him out of the press. I checked our computer today, and since 1983, he has been, in, been mentioned in 862 stories in our newspaper. Warren says he'll speak for about 90 seconds and then <laughs> turn to questions. So, Warren, I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Obituaries, I feel fine about them. <laughs> the, uh, one of the comments that Howard Simons used to make at the uh, Washington Post, Howard Simons was the managing editor at the time of Watergate under Ben Bradley, later went on to run the Neiman uh, program, and uh, when people, people constantly complain to you in the news business know that, uh, you know, how can you write about business when you haven't been in business, and how can you write about sports when you haven't been a football player yourself, and, and his retort to that was, you don't have to be dead to write obituaries. <laughs> <laughs> now, the topic of dealing with the news media seems to me that probably the best advice I can give to you who have to do that is that it's really very much like the old advice about making love to a porcupine that should be done very carefully. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, I have, uh, I have very fond memories uh, uh, of the media because I wouldn't... Uh, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the newspaper business. Uh, my uh, grandfather, in 1905, bought the Cumming County Democrat in West Point, Nebraska. Believe it or not, in West Point, which was probably 2,000 people in those days, there were two newspapers, the West Point Republican and the Cumming County Democrat. His grandson learned something on it, what it's like to operate in the two newspaper town from my grandfather. But the, uh, uh, these two newspapers existed, and my my grandfather had his family, and my mother and her sisters and one brother, they lived over the, uh, uh, the newspaper in a little uh, string of rooms on the second floor. And uh, when my mother was 11, uh, she literally could uh, run a linotype. As a matter of fact, the intertype people who made linotypes in those days wanted her to travel to Des Moines to exhibit the operation of a linotype to prove their statement that uh, such a simple machine that even an 11-year-old could operate it. And uh, she uh, would go down to the uh, train station for twice a day, uh, the train would come through, and she would uh, get on the train when it stopped, because news was a little sparse in West Point. She'd interview people, write stories uh, for the paper. She sold ads for the paper. It was all during high school years. She started the West Point uh, high school paper. And uh, when she got out of high school, she was 16, but 
she worked three years in the newspaper to get the money to go to a school at the University of Nebraska. And when she got to the University of Nebraska, one of the first things she did was to go to the Daily Nebraska and apply for a job. And uh, the fellow that uh, interviewed her was my dad, who was the editor of the Daily Nebraska. Now, six, a few months later, after the first semester, my, my granddad lost his foreman who bought a paper in, in uh, Eustis, Nebraska himself. And so he called my mom and asked her if she'd come back to help out with the paper. Uh, which she did, so she took off a semester and then came back again to Nebraska and uh, a year or so later uh, married my dad. But uh, uh, the fact that uh, two sides of the family had a strong interest in the newspaper business, coupled with a stock market crash, I must admit, because my dad actually wanted to go into newspapering, but back in those days, um, and he had an offer from Greg McBride, I think it was, at, uh, at a television <coughs> someplace yeah. at the house where McBride told him to make up his mind. Uh, and my dad, it was a blind editor in a small town Nebraska he was going to go to work for. But he had that idea at the time, which was long passed out of uh, favor, that uh, he would let his father, who had paid for his education, uh, call the shots on his first job. And, and my grandfather on that side uh, had different ideas. So he came to Omaha, became a stock salesman. And uh, I was born in 1930, but I was conceived. Uh, right around November 30th, 1929. <laughs> uh, those of you who have been put together what it would be like selling stocks in the fall of 1929, <laughs> my conception will understand what happened. <laughs> so that's, that's, uh, that's the story of how I got here. <laughs> and uh, I've spent the rest of my life trying to figure out how to, how, how to avoid having the media end my life. And, uh, and I guess that's the subject of the uh, 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 of our uh, seminar uh, this evening, and I, I think the best way to do this is just throw it open for questions. I've, I've been around newspapers uh, a long time. I worked for the Lincoln Journal in college. I worked, I delivered uh, five newspaper routes when I was in Washington. I had two tenths of one percent of all the Washington Post circulation in 1944. And I had this marvelous system because I delivered both the Post and its competitor, the Times Herald. So what? Uh, my service was a little sloppy, and people changed papers. They found my smiling face there. <laughs> there, was a, there was a publisher in, in, in Alabama many years ago that said he owed, his, he owed his prosperity to two fine American institutions, monopoly and nepotism. <laughs> I guess back when I was learning those papers, I figured out the monopoly aspect of it. Let's, uh, let's start in with some questions, and, and, and uh, uh, the tougher the better. Yeah? Um, I never thought I'd have a chance to ask you a question like this, but uh, I take the Washington Post National Weekly Edition. And several years ago, uh, Hobart, Hobart Rowan had in his column on the second page, I guess it is, that uh, the real national deficit, na national debt, was something in the matter of, in the form of about $14 trillion. Now that was three or four years ago, and I was shocked by the statement. Nobody ever seemed to pick it up, and I'm just wondering, was there nothing to it? Uh, because I quoted him on the okay. day. Well, it's a good figure. Don't stop. I mean, <laughs> I mean we've had 128 tax increases in Arkansas. So we've got the tax the, uh, Bart was probably referring to uh, Bart, Bart was probably referring to the uh, to the actual debt, which may have been three and a half trillion. Then, yeah. Plus, he may have been taking the present value of actuarial promises to people in the Social Security system and. When you have promised virtually everyone uh, a retirement income, which is geared to inflation, and you present value that, you get a huge sum. Now, on the other hand, the federal government obviously has the power to tax people in those future years to, in effect, make transfer payments. And Social Security really isn't an insurance uh, fund or, or an insurance operation. It started out with sort of that idea in mind, but it's it, it's. It's accepted as what they call an intergenerational transfer payment now, and and uh, uh, as long as the federal government 
has the power to tax, it may have to tax more and more because it's under taxing now in relation to its actual actuarial cost. But it has enormous assets too. Uh, it, uh, uh, the value of all American corporations is four trillion. Uh, the government gets 34 percent of their profits. The stockholders get 66 percent. I'm leaving out state income taxes. You can say the government owns it. 34 percent of those corporations in terms of their earning power, and it has the right to increase its ownership merely by passing a bill that they're going to get 40 percent of the profits or 50 percent of the profits. And so it has enormous assets. It has enormous liabilities, and you can play around with either side of the equation, but essentially uh, uh, the, the country has more taxing power than it's used, which is why people don't get too upset about the 400 billion national debt. They, they know there is untapped taxing power. Now, it may be that politicians don't have the will to do it, but they have the ability to do it. And that, uh, that, keeps, uh, uh, that keeps government bonds selling as, as the safest, roughly the safest investments in the world. Okay, how about a media question here? Well, yeah. Uh, the Buffalo News will. Does the Buffalo News endorse a uh, candidate, and will you be participating in that uh, uh, endorsement? Uh, the, the Buffalo News endorses candidates. That's a. Uh, they, I think they had that policy when I went there, but I know that they would have that policy uh, uh, under our ownership, which began in 1977. Uh, Murray Light. The editor of the Buffalo News just wrote a column on that just a few weeks ago. He writes a column every week, and uh, by and large, they determine their own endorsements. Uh, it's interesting. We had five congressional candidates some years back from uh, from uh, Buffalo. They may not have that many in the current <coughs> census. I'm not sure, but these are people that one way or another touched it. The SMSA up there is about a million three, and so we made five endorsements. Oh, it was 82 or so. I think Jack Kemp was still even the congressman then. Uh, but in any event, we endorsed, I, he, he was a congressman, because we endorsed Barbara Conable, Jack Kemp, Hank Nowak, and who else? And if you looked at these five fellows' voting records, you could see no similarity whatsoever. So I, I discerned that essentially our policy was to, at that time was to endorse incumbents. But uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, guess, I, I don't know what was with this time. It, uh, but uh, we do have a policy of endorsing. We, we think that to give opinions on every other subject in the world uh, daily, uh, that if we if we back off giving an opinion on that, it doesn't seem to make sense. I don't think people pay much attention when you get to presidential races. I think that the, the less the public is interested in the race, the more newspaper endorsement means. Probably doesn't mean, in the presidential race, I would guess the endorsement means virtually nothing. Uh, but I still think we ought to do it. <coughs> yeah? What stories do you think the media is really missing the boat on these days? I'm thinking particularly along the lines of business stories, but feel free to take it beyond that. That you think maybe they're blowing out of proportion beyond their significance or just ignoring a story that's maybe ripe for exposure right now? Right. Well, the, the, the media, and, and I, I've gotten this question over the last 20 years, and when I attend the Washington Post, they have what they call the Pug Wash Summer, and they always, they always ask about what are the big stories, and and then you tell them and then they groan. Uh, because <laughs> the trouble is, uh, the big stories are, are, are not the ones that happen like Hurricane Andrew. They're the ones that happen over time and they get very boring and there's, and, and there's never a news peg that really grabs you where you can say it's dramatic. I mean, no one has ever run a story on the fact that, you know, I gained three ounces today because I ate 500 calories more than I burned up. I mean, it's, it's not, but if 20 years later I weigh 200 pounds more than I weigh coming in, all of a sudden that, that become, might become a story. But it's very hard on anything that has a, a, a very uh, slow, glacial-like almost uh, impact on society to write about those things. It's also difficult to legislate about them. You know, they, they say that the problem is that the very often on the important questions, the policy cycle is longer than the electoral cycle. The policy cycle is also longer than the news cycle. And it, uh, it's much, it's easy to write about them after they happen, whether it's the SNL debacle or whatever, but uh, writing about them while they're happening, uh, because they're happening one inch at a time, and it, you know, it isn't that much different today than yesterday, it's very difficult to cover them. I mean, obviously, the, the, the the big story is is uh, 
the fiscal imbalance we have in, 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 at the national level. But, uh, but it's been around so long. What new can you say on it? And how much different is it if the deficit's going to be 378 billion to 377 billion or something this year? Very tough to write about those subjects. Second thing is that sometimes they get intricate. At the Sun, many, many years ago, 20 years ago plus, uh, I talked to Paul Wing, a marvelous, marvelous editor of uh, the, the thrift, uh, uh, not the, the, not the, the industrial loan scandal that you could see was going to come in Nebraska. I mean, if you looked at the balance sheets uh, of the, which were sketchy of the industrial loans and you saw the regulation on everything, you knew there was going to be a very significant problem. But we didn't have anyone at the Sun really that could write that. We debated bringing in somebody from the outside, just hiring somebody who knew a lot about accounting and, and banking and so on to work on a special assignment for it. And there's the old problem that that's demoralizing to your staff. But the truth is, the Sun, I don't know how many reports we had, but we just, we didn't have it kind of of the depth of manpower or, or, or specialization that could actually write that story. It's easy to write after it happened. I mean, when Commonwealth sightings happen, or something, it's, a, it's a cinch. But that is, that is the tough problem. Uh, uh, it's, take the population problem over time. I mean, how, you know, at, uh, Malthus started writing about it, and he's taken a lot of abuse for a couple of hundred years. And uh, uh, you know, it's no fun to be a hero 50 years after you die. And uh, to come on the news some night, you know, and say we have this terrible problem. We've got, got 28,000 more people in the country than we had yesterday. You know, and five billion, and uh, you know, run for uh, Planned Parenthood or whatever. It's a little difficult. And uh, I think that the better news organizations uh, depends on resources, but but probably the best attack something like that by occasionally doing something in the way of a special or, you know, the, the long story. I think the Philadelphia Inquirer has done two or three of them in the last five or six years. They've had enormous requests for reprints. Uh, and uh, uh, those probably have some impact. Uh, but it's uh, the undiscovered fraud or something like that, you know, we wouldn't, it was just, if I knew about it, I'd be shorting the stock or doing something at the moment. It's, it's uh, <laughs> It's hard to uh, it's hard to come up with a blockbuster story that also has reader impact or viewer impact, and uh, uh, there isn't there's not a great answer for that. Yeah. Talking to uh, <clears throat> about uh, the business pages and uh, one particular story recently that which uh, Berkshire Hathaway has been involved in, and you personally connection with Wells Fargo. Have you lost your confidence in Wells Fargo? Oh, I, I won't comment on the okay. stock. <laughs> I'm going to let up the Bob's uh, introduction on, on that sort of thing. I, I, uh, I never get into recommending uh, uh, or, or even commenting on, on, on individual companies. Yeah? If you were limited in your reading to two financial publications, which two would you buy? Well, I've answered that differently, differently five or ten years ago. I, I, uh, I would probably go, I would probably, assuming I'd split it up between daily and, and uh, I'd probably go with the New York Times and, uh, and uh, probably Fortune. I'm, I'm assuming I could get all the things from Value Line and all that on statistics, but in terms of news publications, probably be the case. And, uh, I'll tell you an interesting story on that. It, uh, about four years ago, five years ago, if you get the New York Times annual report, up in the lead paragraph of Salzberger's letter, maybe the second paragraph, he said the New York Times was distributed on a same-day basis to virtually every important metropolitan city in the United States. That time it wasn't distributed at all. And <laughs> so I wrote a letter, and I said, Dear Punch, I said, you know, it's a shame to have that qualifier in there. And uh, I said, uh, what really I find galling is that I have a friend in Des Moines which has a population half that of Omaha, and they are uh, getting he is getting, in this case, uh, the paper delivered daily, and, and I said, here we are in Omaha, we can't get it. And I sent a copy to my friend in Des Moines. My friend in Des Moines, who did not know Salzberger, Joe Rosenfield, wrote him a letter and said, dear Mr. Salzberger, he says, I understand you're here, you're not in Omaha. <laughs> and he said, 
It's true, of course, that statistically, uh, Des Moines is smaller than, than Omaha, and, and he said, of course, he said those people spelled in the name of their state backwards and do a few things like that. <laughs> but he said, he said, I've considered his request, and he said, he said, you probably should do it, because it's, if you look at it, it's part of your outreach program. And he said, he said, at first, I'll only read the horoscope, but he said, you know, later, who knows what will happen. So anyway, we started getting the New York Times. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's my letter or Joe's, but uh, I think I'll get it the same day. Yeah, Bob? Would you comment on your, uh, your, your attitude or your policy, I guess, on interviews? You uh, particularly do not uh, give interviews, as I understand, uh, for anyone who wants to write a, a profile type interview. I'm wondering how long ago you started that and uh, why did you start it, and do you think it's a good idea? Well, I would say I probably spend, I, I may be right, I'm, I'm sure there's somebody spends more, but I, I probably have spent more time over the last 10 years, if I've probably spent more time, and even, or, or over the last year, with media people, I mean reporters, uh, than any other CEO I know. Now, you know, they take, each one takes up a, a, a lot of time. I've had five, uh, profiles in the last four years by, by some form of national media, Linda Graham in the LA Times, uh, L.J. Davis in the New York Times, uh, uh, I can't think of the gal's name, but four of them. So th on top of that, I get all kinds of people calling me on special aspects of certain things. Now, I don't know whether I average uh, two hours a week or something like that. But if I didn't control it, it would be it'd be 80 hours a week. I mean, the number that want to talk individually is, you know, is astronomical. And I try to, the interviews, I, I never knew L.J. Davis or Linda Grant or uh, uh, those people before. But in terms of specific stories, somebody's calling about the SNLs or accounting or banks or, uh, I try as much as possible to talk to people that know a fair amount about the subject because otherwise you can spend 45 minutes or an hour and you're basically giving a course in insurance 101 or something of the sort. And in the end, they, they don't know enough to write a good story. I mean, it's I'm not knocking them for it, but they just don't. I mean, it, it, some of the issues get pretty complicated. And on the other hand, I'm willing to spend 45 minutes or an hour with somebody that knows a lot about it already but is, is, is looking for the nuances and, and that sort of thing. So I, I spend a, a fair amount of time, but uh, oh, I would say on some of the stories that broke, we might have had a hundred calls or something. I mean, if you take ten minutes each, and we never had a public relations function. Now, Solomon, they had a dozen people or so in public relations, and when the when the scandal broke, they took on all kinds of temporary help. I don't know what the maximum number of people they would have had at one time there, but twelve was the normal complement in, in, in that department, and I wouldn't be surprised if they got up to thirty or forty people. And they were answering phones all the time. And, and essentially, we're not equipped to do it. We don't need to do it. I find it interesting to talk uh, to some journalists sometime. But I don't find it productive or interesting to do it the whole time. And, uh, and that's, you know, the, the guideline is, if I know they're good, you're gonna, you want to spend more time with them on it than, than if you aren't, if they aren't. And of course, I know some that are good by now, and I'm not inclined to do a lot of experimenting. I mean, I don't go to a lot of new restaurants either. <laughs> we have a question over here. On the yeah, list. sure. Mm -hmm. Here's a uh, quote from the book Feeding, Feeding Frenzy. Public officials and many other observers see journalists as rude, arrogant, and cynical, <laughs> given to exaggeration, harassment, sensationalism and gross insensitivity. How do you comment on that? Well, it's interesting. I, in all of, uh, in all of uh, I'm going to be wrong on this, but uh, I, I, uh, there's 1,600 newspapers in the country, and uh, uh, the only one I can think of that really has a media critic that writes regularly is the LA Times with David Shaw, and David writes some very good stuff. In fact, maybe they've done it. I, I would think it'd be a good idea to put some of his together in a book. Uh, uh, and David, back uh, a few years back, writes a very good column. And you know, those LA Times stories go on forever, so you cover a lot of ground. And he uh, he interviewed 40 editors, uh, all probably all of whom with 
names you recognize, plus Brokaw and a few people like that, and asked them about the stories that had been written about them. And of course, they came up with all those adjectives. They, uh, he found that the biggest problem that they had was with inaccuracy, and the second biggest problem they had was uh, with a predetermined uh, conclusion. That's the problem. Another problem in talking to uh, anybody that calls. So often you'll have somebody who's already written the story in their mind. I mean, it, they know what they want. They're looking for one sentence they can get from you in a 45-minute interview that they can use to buttress the point they've already arrived at. So they are really not interested in going through a logical development of a subject, but they're really quotation shopping. And, and they can afford to spend 45 minutes with you and uh, to get the one sentence that they'll stick in. And these editors in the Shaw interview, Tom Winship of the Globe, all, all the people you know, and uh, they, that was their second biggest beef. And they all said that once they'd had it done to them, it made them a little more sensitive. In fact, one guy said that, that he thought he tried subsequently to write every story, and then when he got all through, to substitute either his brother or his son or his mother, depending on what was appropriate in terms of age bracket, as the person in the story that was being written about, and both do in terms of the, the spin he was putting on it, as well as, as, well as the uh, checking for accuracy and all of that sort of thing. And uh, uh, what I think you get, frankly, I think you get people under deadline, which creates a certain pressure that you don't get, let's say, in the magazine field or something of the sort. You get sort of a bell-shaped curve of human behavior and, and of talent, which you get if you look in the military or you look in, in a religious organization or a business or anyplace else. You get some people that are very talented, some people that are, uh, are not talented at all, and you get a lot in the middle. Uh, you get a lot of mediocrity. Uh, you get overwhelmingly people, but you get some people that are super ethical. You get a great many, that, great majority, that are reasonably ethical, but if the story's big enough, they might you know, forget to mention a reporter for just a few minutes into the interview. And uh, then you get uh, some that are, there's a few that are patently unethical. And it, it, it's a, uh, it's, it's not an unusual selection uh, of people compared to uh, other activities. And, and if you uh, deal with a lot of people over a lot of time, you're going to have a lot of different experiences. I, mean, I forget that number Bob had. I'm sure I didn't talk to all 832 times. But, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, you know, overwhelmingly, the people are just as you would expect the people in the Nebraska Furniture Mart or, or National Indemnity or any other place to be, most of them are trying to do their job well and, and have achieved various levels of competence, partly related to their talents, partly related to their experience. And uh, you're going to have mostly good experiences, but we're going to have some people at the Mart who have a bad experience when buying something. Or, you know, they, we, we will have the rude salesperson. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not way different, I don't think, in the, in, in the press. Uh, uh, if you have a lot of experiences, you'll have you'll have a few bad ones. Now, the, the tough part about it is is that essentially there is no one, uh, virtually with the exception of an assassin, that can do you as much damage as somebody can in the press if they do it something the wrong way. Uh, there are as many hard there are other people out there that and that may be innocent or it may be it may be intentional depends on the circumstances. There may be doctors out there who can just much hard, but you initiate the transaction. I mean, you, you, uh, you go see the guy, and, and, and you may sign a consent form on what he does you. There may be lawyers that do you way more trouble, but by and large, you have the ability to opt in or opt out of the transaction. You walk in the furniture market, you get a bad experience, most of the time you get a good experience. But in, in, in you, do not have the, you do not have the option uh, in the news business of opting out of the story. You can, you can decide how you're going to behave in relationship to it, but you can't opt out of it. So if, if you do get the worst of either human nature or reporting skills or something, uh, you, there, there's no way that you won't be a participant. And that, that's an unusual arrangement in society. Uh, one, of the, one person has a similar power, but again, largely involves somebody else initiate, federal prosecutor or, or any kind of prosecutor has the decision to prosecute or not prosecute. The very fact that prosecute <coughs> is a semi, I mean, it has done a lot of damage whether you're innocent or, or not finally. And, and so that person has the power simply by initiating something to cause you all kinds of trouble 
uh, no matter how innocent you may be or anything else. And, but that isn't used that extensively. But the, the news business has that power. It's the nature of it. You take it away from it, but it, it is the nature of it. And the other unusual aspect, of course, of the news business, the newspaper business particularly, is that uh, unlike in my grandfather's day, uh, there are 1,600 plus daily papers in the United States. And essentially, with exceptions you can almost count on one hand, uh, there are no competing papers. And the reason, of course, is, is that the essential economics of the business drive it to, toward one newspaper per, per city or town or metropolitan area. Uh, nothing evil about it or you know, anything of the sort. It's just it's what Tom Winch had used to call survival of the fattest. And eventually, there is no red ribbon in, 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 in the newspaper race. There's a huge blue ribbon, which makes it enormously valuable. And if you come in seconds, you don't come in. And there's virtually no business like that in the country. If you had 1,600 towns, each with one hamburger stand, each with one bank, each with one woman's shoe store, you know, each with whatever it may be, there would be competition that would come in against them. The guy that runs the best shoe store in the country or the best hamburger chain in the country would look at the one, the town with the worst, and he would come in on top of it. But it doesn't happen in newspaper business. I mean, 10 years ago, everybody talked about how terrible the Manchester Union leader was when Loeb was running it. And they said it was the worst newspaper in the country, is Shane Bragg, et cetera. But all these great news organizations with enormous resources, money coming out of their ears, would have dreamt of putting another paper in Manchester, New Hampshire, because they would have gotten their ears pinned back. And they knew it. So they, they, they said, we can put out a wonderful newspaper, and Bill Wolf puts out a terrible newspaper. But they didn't want to try and compete with them, because it doesn't lend itself to competition. And therefore, you essentially have a business that will make a lot of money if you're terrific. It'll make a lot of money if you're lousy. And uh, there's no difference. I mean, the, the, uh, you pick a paper that you tell me you think is lousy, and I will show you one with 30% profit margins. And it, uh, the people always used to laugh at Roy Thompson, and he never, went, he never saw the Council Plus non pro his lifetime. I met him over in London. I asked him one time if he ever been to Council Plus. That was in there. But he knew, he knew the figures, as he said. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't have any feelings about that at all. But a lot of people knocked Thompson newspapers in those years. But they had the highest profit margins. And, uh, and all these people that wanted to say excellence comes be, or excellence produces profitability and we're very rich because we're very good, it doesn't hold water because on that basis, Thompson was the best of them all. And uh, there is no correlation between profits and excellence. So that means that how good a newspaper is depends entirely on the wishes of its owner. Very interesting phenomenon. There's really nothing quite like that in American business. I mean, if you set up a hamburger stand, you turn out lousy hamburgers, you know, McDonald's is going to be next to you or whomever, and you won't be around a year later. I mean, competition, well, if you get terrible service in a business or prices are too high or anything else, you will be put out of business by somebody else, unless you have a regulated monopoly, but the, the, then your profits are limited. And you have a uh, electric light company or a phone company or something. Newspaper business, you are as good as you want to be and you're as bad as you want. And there are 1,600 papers, and there's a wide variety of excellence among those papers, but there is no correlation between excellence and profitability. That's something that publishers hate to talk about. Uh, and it, maybe it's not a good idea not to talk about it, because if you can whip up the troops all the time, tell them the only way we're going to stay alive is if you guys are terrific, probably a good myth to perpetuate. <laughs> but, uh, it, it does, it's not borne out. Yeah? Would you apply that same those same thoughts to television journalism. When will the essential economics of the business create one television station, one television news well, organization? The interesting thing about television, you take the 100 top markets in the country, and I have, and you look at who leads in the, in the nightly news broadcast, the network nightly news broadcast, you will find that not so many years ago it was 100 out of 100, but I will bet it's 95 out of 100, that whoever leads whether it's Brokaw or Rather or Jennings, will be whoever leads the local news before that. And in other words, it's the feed-in that counts. ABC in New York, in Philadelphia, we had as great a, uh, an audience for Jennings, probably still do, but I know we did in the past, as Rather and Brokaw combined. But we had this terrific feed-in from the local news before. Single most important factor, tough on the anchorman's ego, but it happens to be true. Now, what's the biggest factor in what local news is watching? 
It's the feed-in before. That's why you won't have Oprah. I mean, it's, it's dynamite to have the, the feed-in from a, 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 you know, a 40 share or something like that coming from Oprah. Uh, it, you, you, gotta, you say, well, this is all circular. You know, you're going to have trouble at some point. Incidentally, Good Morning America and the, and the morning show on NBC used to get a benefit from a feed-in from people leaving the dials on Carson. Uh, from the previous evening, and it, uh, it's, it's amazing. Somebody wants to set their dial up there where they wanted it, and just uh, kept running around the clock. But uh, ABC, Cap City's ABC, is number one in local news in every market they're in. They're in New York, Chicago, LA, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Houston. Uh, Fresno, Wally Durham, to go down the line. And, uh, you know, it's hard for me to uh, figure out exactly why that is, except those guys are terribly smart programmers. I mean, they are really, they're dynamite. And uh, uh, they also, in Buffalo, there's a fellow I've heard once that's been on, on the ABC affiliate there for 30 years. Uh, pe people do build up real followings. That's why anchor people, that's why an anchor person who is drawing, particularly in a larger city, a, uh, a huge uh, audience is worth a lot more than anybody on the newspaper. It's kind of sad for those of us who like newspapers, but, but you, you can't, you can, you can be the world's greatest, you can be Bart Rowan or whatever maybe, you can be the world's greatest uh, newspaper writer and you can't make a fraction of what an anchor person can make that draws an extra share point or two uh, on the news in LA or New York. Uh, when I watch those local news shows in those bigger cities, I, I have trouble seeing the difference myself. But, uh, 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 you know, whether it's, uh, and I know during the sweeps period that, you know, we jazz them up. Uh, and obviously, I've seen it done. And uh, uh, so you have to come to the conclusion that jazzing them up works. It doesn't have any effect on newspapers. Yet. And the newspaper and television business are two fundamentally different businesses because basically people only want to read one newspaper a day. Whereas the television, is, and you can't attract it by offering it for 20 cents instead of 25 cents or 15 cents. I mean, when the, you've gone through a paper, you, nine people out of 10 don't want to read a second paper. But with the television station, of course, you can jump from station to station. Now, if the television set had developed like the VCR, so you had to make a decision between VHS and beta, you literally had to go with one format or another. Let's say when you bought your television set, let's say technology forced you to only buy one channel. Now, we'd have 12 television sets around at, you know, a thousand bucks each, you know, and go from set to set. If, if, this, if the world had developed that way, you would have had one network become preeminent and really drive the others out of business because you would have gotten, again, a survival of the fattest type thing where once, as it happened in VCRs, where the VHS format got far enough ahead of the beta, it puts the other out of business. But essentially, with television, you can roam among newspapers. And you can do it very easily. And you, they're, they're just sitting there. You don't have to move. You don't have to buy another product or anything else. And that creates a whole different dynamic. It's an awfully good business, but it's a different dynamic. Question over here? Yeah. <coughs> you comment on another branch of journalism. I'm thinking now of the journalistic books, such as Michael Lewis's Liar's Poker, that deal with Wall Street and related subjects. Do you read them? What do you think of them? Yeah, well, I, I, I read them. I read everything. I spend about seven hours a day reading or so, and my family thinks it's more. But the, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the novel, the, the, the journalistic book, just like the docudrama on, on television, I just got through reading the screenplay for Barbarians at the Gate. Now, I know a lot of the characters in it. I read the book. And I'll tell you, I mean, what 10, 20, 30 million people are going to form an opinion of Henry Kravis. Ross Johnson and all those, based entirely on how some screenwriter uh, wrote that. And screenwriter sticks to some extent the facts, but but he he makes it interesting. He makes some caricatures to some degree. And uh, I know the guy that the guy that bought that Ray Stark bought that screen that bought the screenwriter for that for twenty five thousand bucks. He's trying to get Henry Kravis to uh, cooperate with him, and he said, Henry, you know, he said, if you cooperate, I'll have Arnold Schwarzenegger play, and if you don't cooperate, I'll have Danny DeVito play. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether he 
cooperate or not, but he's getting the Danny DeVito treatment. And, 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 and everybody it does. I mean, it, it, it is, it, it, so it, it, having known the real facts about a number of books, uh, you know, I would say that, uh, that you get very suspicious about uh, what you read in, in them, but I still find them interesting and I read them. Did you comment on Liar's Poker? Well, I, I can I can say that I know some things that are, are dramatically inaccurate, but I but I and I mean, for example, just the lead part of it, uh, Lewis was never in New York, and uh, I know John Merriweather pretty well, and I think that it's very unlikely that that took place, but it's a good story, and there's nothing you can do about it. Once it's written, you know, millions of people are going to believe it's true, and there's nothing that John Merriweather, or John Goodfriend, or anybody else can do about that. I, I personally would bet a lot of money that it isn't true, but I can't prove it either. I mean, I, I wasn't standing on the trading floor every minute of the day. And, uh, but it makes a better book. And there's an enormous temptation. In fact, I mean, I know authors that are working on books where the publisher is, is pushing them to jazz up the book. It's just, you know, they want to sell books. And uh, after you've given somebody a half a million or a million dollars, I've had big advances offered to me. and, and uh, uh, I would never take an advance on a book. I might write a book, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't take an advance on it because I wouldn't want to. Uh, I wouldn't want to feel indebted to any publisher until I decided what I want to do when I got all through. But, but if somebody's giving you a half a million dollars or a million dollars, and uh, uh, they're going to expect a book that's going to sell, it's it's it's. I I feel very sympathetic to anybody, particularly on a docudrama. I mean, it, what what you could do to somebody on that is just it's terrible. Doesn't mean every one that's done is terrible or anything like that, but I mean, the potential to be taken and put on a screen. You know, I don't know whether Nixon was down on his knees praying with Kissinger, you know, in the, during Watergate or anything, but it doesn't make any difference. I mean, once you once you uh, put it on the screen, that's what tens of millions of people will think. That's what I, I personally hate about a JFK. I mean, I I think the odds of that being an accurate rendition of history are extraordinarily low, but. 20 years from now, more people may believe that than any other rendition. Screen is really powerful. I mean, the books are powerful too, but the screen is, is incredibly powerful. Yeah. What's your response to the criticism that you use the media in handling the uh, Solomon debacle? Well, I mean, there, no, there's no question. We had to, we had to uh, talk to people in some way. They're going to write something every day, and and uh, the first day I went in there, we called the press conference. It was a a day in the, a Sunday in August, and you know all the journalists, must have been a couple hundred of them, showed up in shorts and Levi's and everything else. And but I had to tell them what I had learned in the previous 48 hours, to the best of my knowledge, as to what the situation was, because uh, I couldn't be sure that every fact was right, and I told them that ahead of time. But I could tell them exactly what I knew at that time. I didn't have any problem doing that, and at least then. Uh, they had the opportunity of starting from the same fact base that I did, and then had a further opportunity in, in talking before Congress because we made these 50 or 60 page submissions which laid out every fact that we knew, and we told them that we'd update them every time we knew additional facts. But there's no question that if you have a scandal on your hands, that uh, uh, the best thing to do, in my view, is to, is to lay out everything you know. Uh, never lie under any circumstances. Uh, don't pay any attention to the lawyers. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and basically, don't pay any public relations people. Part. That's the truth. I'll half the audience, but I'll get with the other half later. The, uh, but the, uh, if, if you start letting lawyers get into the picture, you know, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll basically tell you don't say anything. And uh, uh, you know, the world is out there making a judgment about some very fast story that they don't quite understand anyway. They don't quite know the names of these people yet. I, you remember Watergate originally? I mean, it, uh, uh, after a while, you started getting, getting the people located, but it almost took the Urban Committee to, you know, to get things kind of half straightened out for you. And you had these characters coming and going and, and people making self-serving statements and the press getting it wrong sometimes and so on, a lot of things. And you've got to do the best you can to get into your fact base. The biggest problem, of course, is if you get surprised and you find out something you have told them is wrong, I mean, something major, and uh, the only thing then is to just lay it out, and, and yeah, I think it'll be obvious that you probably didn't know it earlier, uh, but 
right straight through. I just figured that that uh, if we told everything we knew, we we gave we waived attorney client privilege. We gave all our material to the government. That uh, a lot of that, you know, became publicly available immediately. Uh, we ran into people, obviously, that were using the press in other ways. We had short sellers in the stock that would call Senate committees or subcommittees, call the press, <coughs> told me how many times, told me about, told the press guy at uh, Solomon about the same voice calling in with, you know, four or five different rumors to, to start that involved uh, foreign exchange problems or all these kind of things. And it's, uh, <coughs> You know, it's a it's a multi-dimensional fire for for a while, and you can't do it perfectly. But you'll never get tangled up if you just basically lay it out as you see it. And I had been, I mean, it's very fortunate when you aren't implicated in any way yourself. I mean, it must be a different thing if you're John Dean or something. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, incidentally, I uh, uh, my friend Jim Burke. Had a, had a problem with Tylenol, and he, he ignored, basically ignored the lawyers. I mean, here's all this product liability and everything out there. But Jim uh, uh, basically just kept playing out as he saw it, and he, uh, you know, he's up 18 hours a day and all that doing it, but it only lasted about five or six weeks. And uh, it's not a bad example. You know, the, the problem, the problem is, you get into what everybody is called uh, lowest common denominator. Uh, journalism. I mean, somebody is going to write it, and then once they write it, it kind of moves along the food chain, and uh, <laughs> they use the term that way. They, uh, uh, and Arthur Ashe, uh, you know, I personally, uh, uh, I wouldn't write that story myself. Now, if I'm editor of some major paper, every other paper in the country is carrying it, or I'm, I'm, the, I'm the news director at uh, the network, uh, you know, I. I, I think that the momentum tends to push it along once it starts, and uh, but I, I don't think it really. Uh, you know, I, I don't. I, I'm not that concerned. There's nothing in the Constitution about the people's right to know. I mean, you know, we trot that out occasionally when we want to justify something we've done that we feel like we really shouldn't have. But the uh, <laughs> but there is not, there's absolutely nothing in there about people's right to know. I mean, it's uh, what you've got to, you've got is the right to say something, but. Uh, but I don't have any right to know, as far as I'm concerned about it. constitutionally or in any other way, about Arthur Ashe's uh, 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 health. And, uh, he's not playing tennis. He's not taking my daughter out. I mean, you know, it's just not, it's not, uh, not a concern to me. And, uh, but it, it will keep coming. I mean, it is, uh, it's not going to stop. Yeah. Uh, is the media a good investment today? If not, what general areas might be without any specific companies? Well, I, uh, I wrote a section in the 91 Annual Report of Berkshire, which we'll be glad to send you a Bob Media investment. And what I say is it's still, a, it's, it's terrific, but it's not quite as terrific as it used to be. It, it's a great business compared to other business. I mean, the return earned on capital actually employed, and it's, it's a very great business. But it is not quite as great as it used to be. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons that the, the news, American Newspaper Publishers Association is fighting with the telephone companies, for example. <laughs> and they they, uh, they uh, are not wild about the idea of freedom of speech for the telephone companies, but the uh, 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 you know nobody is nobody likes competitive. But I was with my friend Tom Murphy uh, watching a uh, Monday night football game at my sister's house. Terrific, 45-inch picture or something of this game. And I said to Murphy. I said, you know, and this was ABC, of course. So I said, what a terrific picture. John Bigger, what a terrific picture. He said, you know, I think better one is eight inches black and white. Of course, then there were only three of us, you see. And, and when Anheuser wanted to sell beer, they came to us, you know. When General Waters wanted to sell Buicks, they came to us. And every year, we just raised the prices. And it was a great business. Uh, that business has gotten diluted. There were three electronic highways in the United States 30 years ago. Three electronic highways pumped into virtually every household in the United States. Think of that. The short, the short uh, factor in in distribution were these highways. There were lots of there's lots of talent, lots of lots of heavyweight fighters out there, lots of people watching at the other end. Only three highways. The highway guy makes all the money then. Now there are all kinds of highways. So Mike Tyson makes all the money, or or well, Holyfield or whomever. 
because talent is the short uh, commodity now, and we're just another electronic highway, and that diminishes. It's still pretty good, incidentally, but, but it's, it's not like it was. The newspaper is terrific, but of course, Advo comes along, and the, the U.S. Postal Service is the biggest threat to the newspaper business. You know, I used to say to the Washington, you know, they, they were terribly worried about the Washington Star, you know, they, what if they got news or whatever, you know. I'd say, you know, let the Washington Star have top draft pick of 100 journalists any place in the United States. All I got to do is just name the names and they all come over to the Washington Star. It's not worth an eighth of a point on the Washington Post stock. But ADVO, I mean, let the, let the U.S. Postal Service drop its third class rates 20%. And you can have a very appreciable effect on the paper, as, as you can if the bells get into the classifying. So that's where the competition comes in. Okay, the, the second part of the question. Yeah, <laughs> what do we buy tomorrow morning, right? <laughs> okay, what are general areas that would be where you would put your money? Yeah, I, uh, I say all I want to say about that in the in the angry report of Berkshire or the Berkshire <laughs> annual meeting. I, I don't go beyond that as Bob knows. It's, uh, right behind you. Uh, you've written pretty extensively about the impact the emotions have on the market. Uh, to what extent can the media influence those emotions on a, a macro basis? And then would you comment on some specific, and you don't have to comment on PS Group, but um, there was an article that drove it up and then there was some comments by somebody in USA Today that shorted it and drove it down. So yeah. what extent does the media have uh, influence on the market. Well, the media generally is on a very short time cycle, so they, they, it's hard for them to say anything of any importance. I mean, what I really want to know is what's going to be, I mean, if you bought Coca-Cola in 1990 and you paid $40, you got a million eight, you know, for that $40. Now, I, I want to know what the next Coca-Cola is, but, but that, that, that is, that's a little slow in unfolding for the, uh, for the newspapers, so you're not going to get a lot out of that. But there is this interesting aspect, I was thinking about this on the way down, uh, you know, basically, News people and I are in the same business. I mean, I go out and I try to report, essentially, on a company. I try to evaluate, I try to evaluate its management, I try to evaluate its competition, its product, its service, its prices, its costs, everything. I'm, I'm trying to do a repertorial job on that business. I may never heard of it before. And that is my job. I assign myself a story. And every morning when I come to work, I mean, it may be triggered by some event, but I assign myself a story. Now, the story always happens to be, what is X worth? But that's a story. And in 1973, when we were buying the Washington Post Company, with a total valuation of $80 million, and Woodward was working on Watergate. Let's say, Water, uh, let's say that Woodward has, had assigned himself a story, just exactly like Bradley had come in and said, Woodward, I want you to spend the next week doing a story on what is the Washington Post Company worth. Now, if Woodward had had that assignment, and he'd gone out for the week, he'd have come in with a pretty damn good story at the end of a week. He would have come in with a story that would have said the Washington Post Company is worth about 400 million, and it was selling for 80 million. Now, if he'd assigned himself that story, he would have made a ton of money. It's assigning yourself the right story, and I, I, I said this to Woodward. I said, why don't you just assign yourself a story to work on between six and seven in the morning? They always, they always want me to tell them what stocks to buy. I always, I always say, well, I'll let you assign yourself the story and work on it from six to seven or one hour a day on your own assignment, and the other eight or ten hours you work for Bradley. And essentially, that's a lot easier story than the stories he's trying to get. He's trying to get the story of what case he's thinking at the CIA or something, you know, or what he's mumbling up in his hospital room. And uh, essentially, it is a hell of a lot easier to figure out what the Washington Post companies were. Like they had at that time four big TV stations. You go interview some TV brokers. You find out what other sales were. I mean, it is not a, it is not a tough story. And the interesting thing to me is that all of the journalists that have covered, you know, Berkshire over. 25 years, they come in, they write about Berkshire, and they look at the company, but virtually none of them have bought the stock. And it's usually not against the code of ethics. I mean, as long as they, as long as they tell, at most publications, certainly all the big magazines and all that, all they have to do is give the information to their, their editors to what they're doing and not buy right before an article and all that sort of thing, you know, over a long time. But here are all these people, they're, they're doing all this work on Berkshire, you know, and they're trying to figure out what I'm thinking and what we're doing, and they look at the record, but they never do anything about it. They just they write a story and then they, they go on to something else and uh, I just say that you know somehow they that the, their brain isn't quite connected to their eyeballs sometimes. <laughs> yeah. they, 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 but all the time they're saying, "What do I do with my money?" You know, I should have my Series E bonds. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's, 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 
So I say 90% of investing is assigning yourself the right story. The reporting of it is fairly easy. We have time for one more question. Okay. Seems to have intimidated. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I've sat in on all these things every four years where Arun Arlich and Sam always go through all this. And it's, you know, it is very tough because people do love the horse race aspect of it. And, and journalists love, love the horse race aspect of it. And that's why, you know, the, the journalists all basically were, you know, are orgasmic when, when Bro was in it. I mean, that really made it interesting. It didn't have anything to do whether it was good for the country or anything like that, but it was interesting. And uh, it was a lot, I mean, you, you, you know, you grab the paper every day and you, uh, I think that uh, I, I see a number of papers that are making uh, real, I think very dumb on television, except on the news shows. I mean, I think Brinkley and those shows are very good, and I watch them every week. But I think, I think in the network news, it's very tough. And I don't, think, I don't think you get very much about the campaign on the network news. I think some papers do a particularly good job. I'd say the New York Times and the Post do a very good job on, on, on covering uh, what the, uh, the candidates do. If you get that Washington Post Weekly that was referred to, which I get, uh, there, there's a lot in there, and they, they make a real attempt to do it. Whether people, what the readership is of, of that compared to Jennifer Flowers, I don't know. But but, uh, but they, the, 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 the column inches are there, and some quality reporters are working on it, and uh, uh, it's available. You won't get it on network news, though, I might go ahead. And, uh, it just 22 minutes doesn't, doesn't really do it. will be joining Mr. Buffett for dinner up at the club. I ask you all not to crowd into one elevator. <laughs> and there will be plenty of time to get up there. Um, we're adjourned. I thank you again, Mr. Buffett. Thanks, Amy. Thank